Um, good morning, and thank you very much for tuning in to listen to me for the next 15 minutes or so. My name is Neil Greenberg. I'm a, a psychiatrist, um, and you can see up there uh, my Twitter handle uh, and uh, my title. So next slide, please. Um, so I'm, uh, I work with King's College London, and I chair the Royal College of Psychiatry Special Interest Group in Occupational Psychiatry. And uh, my interest is very much um, in how do organisations um, help staff who are doing really challenging work uh, deal with their difficulties. Uh, and the reason I put my Twitter uh, handle up there is we pump all our uh, academic research out uh, via that uh, Twitter handle. So um, if you're interested in that, please uh, do follow me. Um, over the last year or so, I've been working closely with NHS England and Improvement uh, on what was the wellbeing team is now the Recovery Commission. What I hope to try and do is to try and give you an overview of what the evidence is uh, about how you best to support staff, uh, obviously rather briefly. Next slide, please. Um, there's all the different sources of information uh, and um, the papers that we've produced so far are downloadable there. Next slide, please. So it's fair to say that over the last uh, year and a bit, uh, there's been exposure to various different sorts of stresses, lots of trauma, particularly at work, but also sometimes in people's personal life. We all know that the workload and shift pattern has been um, very challenging, to say the least. And of course, many people have lost loved ones and also financial pressures um, have been shown by the data to be a particularly big impact upon staff, um, no matter whether they're, they're working in the NHS elsewhere or, or sadly individuals who, who don't have a job. Uh, and the evidence is pretty clear that the lower paid uh, members of society are most at risk from the uh, psychological impact. And then there's this issue which is called moral injury. Next slide, please. So moral injury refers to the uh, emotions, the strong distressing emotions that you can experience after you um, are in a situation where your moral or ethical code has been violated to some degree. Um, and that might well be in a sort of healthcare setting, you know, I wanted to deliver the best quality care but I just wasn't able to. And you can see on the bottom, the sort of color coding spectrum there, that moral injury doesn't just occur by itself. It's part of a, a spectrum. People can be well, they can be a bit distressed, they can be injured, and that injury may go on to cause them to suffer with a formal mental health difficulty like PTSD um, or depression are the most uh, common ones. But um, sadly, also suicidality is also there. Next slide, please. Um, and um, certainly all that data that I've just mentioned about the sort of links with mental health is, is in, in that uh, academic paper, if you're interested. Next slide, please. Um, we've got a big study going on at the moment, from King's College London, called NHS Check. Uh, it's got 27,000 NHS staff, not just clinicians. These are staff right across the board, you know, all doing highly important jobs. And what we did in that study is to look at uh, people's exposure to morally injurious uh, incidents, um, very much about not being able to deliver the right care, feeling let down by others, um, or, or, or thinking that they didn't uh, do things or they did do things that, that really sh shouldn't have happened. And we split this into people with low, medium and high levels of moral injury. And the reason I put this slide up is to show you um, that all the different bars are all different sorts of mental health conditions. But it's the people who've got the high level of moral injury there who seem to have the worst mental health. So this is a particularly important topic for NHS staff at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, these are things that you can do to try and help your staff stay well. So the first thing is to formally buddy people up. So rather than just say, speak to your colleagues, what that means is you say, Peter, Sandra, on this shift, part of your job is to look out for each other. I want you to check in every hour. And um, um, if things aren't good, you want to do something about it. And if you've got a problem, come and speak to me, the supervisor, if that's not good. So we know that social support at work is really useful in terms of protecting mental health. But the most important relationship at work is the relationship between the employee and their immediate line manager, their supervisor. And the supervisors need to be able to feel that they can carry out what we call a psychologically savvy chat. And that means they feel confident enough to know how to have you know, brief well-being focused conversations with staff um, as and when they need them and certainly at the end of a shift. And there's a nice little phrase, which is a, a check up from the neck up um, to see how people are doing before they uh, disappear home or, or particularly after something difficult has happened. And the evidence uh, about uh, the impact of supervisors on mental health is that they can having a good supervisor who can have those well-being conversations can lead to a 90 percent reduction in mental ill health or sickness absence. Great study done in Australia. Uh, they looked at fire station managers who got trained up to speak to uh, their staff about mental health after trauma. 
and they found that that led to a 90 percent reduction in sickness absence costs over the next six months so that was a really big impact for my short uh, half day training next slide please so what we did uh, on the basis of that is we developed um, some training which is called react stands for recognize engage actively listen check risk and talk about a specific plan. And this was delivered to NHS supervisors um, um, over the um, middle of last year, uh, to well over a thousand of them. And it was a brief package uh, delivered uh, over Zoom. So a bit of didactic talking, uh, a bit of uh, demonstration, watching a video about how it worked and then getting people in the breakout rooms to actually practice using the React skills uh, to improve their confidence. Next slide, please. And what we did is we did a small pilot study that's just been published in the journal Occupational Medicine. And what we did here was to look at the supervisor's confidence in having uh, conversations with their staff and in identifying problems and also coming up with a, a management plan about those difficulties. What you can see from this graph is that before the training, over half of the managers, supervisors did not feel confident in talking about mental health to their staff. And one month after the training, uh, nearly 85% of them felt confidence. And this was a bite-sized training, you know, just one hour long. Um, and so I think that's a really uh, important um, finding there. Uh, and we know that the confidence increase is likely to lead to them having better conversations, which is good for staff's mental health. And uh, we've now increased that training to an hour and a half to add in information about moral injury. And uh, we're running uh, React train the trainer sessions with NHS England, which are being rolled out uh, as we speak uh, across across England. Next slide, please. Um, so as well as having uh, good relationships with your colleagues and good relationships with uh, your supervisors, there is also a role for formal peer support. And what peer support is, is a process where uh, individuals have training uh, to be able to detect uh, difficulties in their colleagues uh, and then to be able to put in place practical management strategies um, and then to monitor people. And if people are recovering, to make sure those individuals uh, get helped to go and seek professional support. Next slide, please. One program that um, has a, a lot of traction is the Trauma Risk Management, the TRIM program. Uh, this started um, in the UK military. I, I served in the military for, for 23 years of my life. Uh, and uh, what TRIM is, is a two day training package. Um, and so this to train up someone to be an effective uh, peer supporter after traumatic or challenging events. And what TRIM training does is to take initially it was taking a frontline Marine or chef or sailor or an airman or soldier and giving them an understanding about what traumatic stress is and about what it can impacts it can have on people. Um, and then giving them the uh, confidence and skills with lots of practice to sit down and have a structured interview with their colleagues uh, three days after a traumatic event and then again about a month later. And the idea of these conversations was to identify people who might have difficulties uh, uh, if they've got difficulties early on to manage them actively um, support people within the team. Uh, and if that doesn't help after a month or so, then it's to get those people um, moved on to, to see a mental health care professional. And we've now published 13 academic papers on TRIM. This is not penicillin for trauma, but it certainly is a very credible way with a randomized control study showing that it helps organizational functioning and, and importantly, doesn't do any harm. Next slide, please. Because on the harm side, next slide, please, what we absolutely do know is, um, so next slide, please, is um, that um, one of the ways that organizations have helped, tried to help is by using what's called psychological debriefing. And this is the idea that after a traumatic event, what you do is you phone up your counselors or you, phone, you bring in your mental health team and you try and get them to speak to staff. Uh, and this is a slide that comes from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And what it very clearly says is do not do psychological debriefing. So there is no role for mental health professionals to be called in in the aftermath of a difficult time or a difficult incident uh, to speak with staff proactively to improve their mental health. NICE specifically say do not do it, not just because it's ineffective, but because on average, if you have a group of people who were psychologically de debriefed and a group of people who weren't debriefed, that the ones who have been debriefed are likely to do worse. So it actually has the potential to cause harm. Um, so the role for mental health professionals like me is to support the team to support itself. It's not to come in and in inverted commas, worry the troops, close inverted commas. Um, as you also see there, I've uh, underlined active monitoring. And what NICE very sensibly say, based upon the evidence, is that 
people should have an eye kept on them to make sure that if they do have difficulties as a result of trauma or challenging events, then you can intervene. And there are evidence-based treatments for people who are unwell, um, which is a very different situation to getting mental health professionals to deal with people who are normally distressed. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that really helps and something which is very uh, achievable within the team is to use um, the PIES principles. Uh, I'll run through what they are in just a second, but um, there's a little paper there, which is a, an Israeli study uh, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, which looked at the use of the PIES principles uh, in the Israeli military after the first Lebanon war, which was 1982. And the reason I put that paper up is it has a 20 year follow up and you don't get many 20 year follow up studies. <clears throat> And what the PIES principles are, are about managing people who are having a really tough time and are distressed in the workplace. The first principle is the principle of proximity. And what proximity means is that when someone's having a tough time, you should not just say, well, you know, go home, sort yourself out, come back when, when you can. If you do that, it can lead to them losing their social support, which is so important. And of course, lose, uh, end up with them losing their self-esteem, thinking that everyone thinks that I'm a waste of space and I can't do my job. So proximity instead means let's look at a way of managing you within the workplace that gives you extra support and reduces your pressure uh, uh, you're experiencing. So during the early part of the pandemic this time last year, I was running the mental health strategy at the London Nightingale Hospital while it was open. And what we did there was if we had staff who were on the shop floor dealing with um, critically ill patients and they were having a really tough time is we moved down into the Don and Doffing stations to help with PPE. So they were still doing something useful, but they weren't so exposed to the difficulties and that gave them a chance to recuperate with, uh, to help them get better. Immediacy says that you should nip things in the bud. Don't wait till people go into crisis before you intervene. So try and have early, proactive, psychologically savvy chats, either with peer supporters or with supervisors. Expectancy is that when people are going through a pandemic or having a, been exposed to a difficult incident, it's completely normal and usual to have some symptoms, to not stop thinking about it, to perhaps not concentrate ideally, to be a bit more irritable, to be, um, uh, 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 have a bit of problems with you, perhaps your sleep. If those symptoms are not impairing and if they're not uh, deteriorating, in many cases, they are not a sign that someone is unwell. So expectancy is reassuring people that having some reactions are normal and that most of those reactions will pass over time. But the other side to expectancy is that if people do, don't improve, then, the, then what we will do is we will help you get to do the professional support you need. And the last principle is the principle of simplicity. And what simplicity says is that if people are having a really tough time, say, doing uh, looking at a piece of equipment that they need to monitor and they're really anxious and not doing it right, they don't need a psychiatrist. They need supervised supervision and mentoring to help use that piece of equipment better because that's the best way to reduce their anxiety. Next slide, please. And then we come on to um, to actually where we are now, hopefully, which is the the stage where actually we're looking about getting back to some sense of more normality. Um, uh, we've called it evolution here rather than just recovery, because we don't necessarily want to go back to just where we were before the pandemic. We want to be in a better place. There are a number of things you can do to make it better. Uh, I'll run through them very quickly in just a second. But the key point here is we're not just looking at trying to stop people becoming ill. What we're trying to do is to encourage what we call post-traumatic growth which is this idea that if you um, help people um, um, deal with situations properly, if they deal with them well, then actually they end up stronger than before. So you should be giving people a thank you. You should be giving them a graded return to work rather than send them back into the next chaos. Some time for reflection and meaning making. What was this all about? Best done as a team led by a leader, useful for moral injury. When people come back to work, they, I know this might sound strange or back to their usual work, is they should have a return to work interview, even if they've been working. And that should talk not just about what their experiences was were at work during COVID, but also what's gone in their personal life. Have they had bereavements? What's that financial difficulties? Because if you don't know about those stresses, you can't um, do anything about them and help them. They should be actively monitored to see how they're going. And then if they do become unwell, they should get uh, rapid access to uh, occupationally focused care, care that helps them get back to work. Next slide, please, which is the last slide. Um, so overall, uh, don't over medicalize, try and nip things in the bud, make sure the team supports itself well, use those pious principles and pay attention to um, putting in place a plan to help people improve uh, as they recover as the pandemic improves. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your attention.